Thanks, Robin. It's so great to uh, be talking to you all. It's been really fun getting starting to get to know you and hear your ideas. And I think like Robin said, this is a really great moment for the Bay Area. This cross-pollination of ideas is something that can really kickstart um, the innovation and the retrofitting that we need to do along this incredibly long shoreline. Oh. That's, I think it's upside down. Okay. Okay, so I'll be talking a little bit about resilience and some of our ideas that have been coming up around the ecology of the Bay Shore. This is a really important topic in Northern California. Part of the mellow stereotype that Robin was talking about is that we're also very environmentally oriented. That's true. Uh, people in California, especially Northern California, we're really proud of our environmental legacy and innovation. And I'll be focusing on one aspect of that that's really relevant to shoreline design. So I just want to remind you that we're all in an ecosystem all the time. And sometimes I think when we're in a city or a really built up area, we forget that. There's an underlying natural system that's interacting with the built system here. And that's true along all around the shoreline. And we need to be thinking about that as we consider how to change what the shore looks like. So in 1800, prior to uh, European development of the bay, this relates to the slides Robin was showing, the dominant ecosystem here was tidal marsh. There were almost 200,000 acres of it, and the filling and diking of this marsh, this giant marshes around the bay, were pretty much what contributed to that loss of a third of the bay that Robin was talking about. So why do we care about that? Why do we care about tidal marshes? They're actually one of the most valuable ecosystems on the planet, and that's because they provide a lot of different services. So one of the really key ones that's not on this slide is they help protect the shoreline. You have a mud flat and then a tidal marsh that knocks down waves and reduces erosion along the shoreline. That's really important. But at the same time as providing that wonderful service, they also help clean the water and sequester contaminants. They provide, provide flood risk management by um, spreading out water and sometimes absorbing it. They're really, really productive for the food web. There used to be really rich fisheries in San Francisco Bay before it was so changed. Um, we have endemic wildlife. We have wildlife that's found nowhere else on the planet but San Francisco Bay, and that leads to them being endangered, unfortunately, and regulated. And we also really enjoy our marshes for the scenery and recreation value that they provide. So marshes are important in the Bay Area. And I just wanted to show you some, a couple of our endangered species. Um, they're both charismatic and cute and also really important if you want to get a permit to do something in a lot of these areas. And it's not just those species that are sometimes feel like they're limiting what people can do. There's a whole rich food web with a lot of biodiversity and again, a lot of um, things that you're only gonna find here and nowhere else. I wanted to point that out for folks from the East Coast or sometimes uh, Gulf Coast, Europe. Our tidal marshes are different because they're really isolated and so we've gotten all this unique evolution happening. That's led to the endangered species and sometimes that creates really different permitting and regulatory issues than you might be used to. Okay, so here were the tidal marshes in 1800. And by 1998, they were really, a lot of them were gone, around 85%, although some restoration had started happening that you can see in the light green. And a bunch of scientists and land managers and regulatory folks came together around that time and said, we've got to do something about this. We need to make a plan because we know we need our coastal wetlands. And I think we all know that now after a lot of the horrible events that have occurred around the world in the last 10 years, it's bad to lose your coastal wetlands. That was recognized around the turn of the century here in the Bay Area, and they came together and made a plan. Everybody agreed it was a huge collaborative process called the Baylands Goals, and they agreed to try to restore 100,000 acres of tidal marsh, so about half of what was here historically. Everybody agreed if we can get half of it back, we're going to have enough of these functions and services that we want. That agreement, that consensus, that collaboration across regulatory and science and land managers created an incredible increase. It may not look like an incredible increase, whoop, incredible increase. But there was really a big change in the amount of restoration that happened in the next 10 years. I'm really doing a bad job here. From 1998 to 2009, a lot of restoration happened. But actually, there was a huge amount of land acquisition, even more than what's been restored so far. So that consensus created a big increase in restoring these tidal marshes. And I um, just want to point out that the future plans for the edge of the Bay Shore that have already been developed don't just include tidal marsh, but they include some of these new system, restored diked wetland in yellow and restored managed pond in blue. These are kind of hybrid, partly managed, partly natural systems that we expect to see in the shoreline of the future and in probably in your designs. We're gonna have to be thinking about how do we mix 
managed or engineered systems to emulate natural processes or to emulate the kind of functions that we want these systems to provide. So we're not expecting to go 100% back to historic natural systems, but they also have a place in the future. And so you can see that at this point, with if, we, if everything that's been purchased is restored, we get to about three quarters of the goal that's been set. And so that's all amazing and great, and I think we could have declared victory and gone home, except for what Robin was talking about. We're looking at this great increase in the rate of sea level rise that's coming and is already, happen is already starting to happen. So I think it's really important that in your designs you tell, you indicate clearly what kind of a sea level rise scenario you're thinking about how many feet or how, in how many years. So there's this recent rising seas report for California, 2017, and they have a scenario that includes 4.4 feet by 2100, has like a 25% a uh, chance of happening. So that's a pretty protective approach. Um, even if you don't pick that one, at least pick something and let us know what it is. And also think about what's the flooding scenario that goes with that in terms of coming from the watershed. Do you have some kind of scenario around a storm or an earthquake? I think it'll be really helpful for the communities that you're working with and the folks that are thinking about your designs You know, when we get to the real stages of implementation to have an idea of what the specs are in terms of climate change. So one of the problems for marshes with sea level rise, marshes are actually really resilient. They can accrete a lot of sediment and grow vertically. They can migrate inland as sea level rises. They're one of these adaptive, flexible, resilient systems that we're looking for. But one of the challenges is they need enough material to do that. And we've had this huge reduction in sediment in the bay. So one thing to know as you're working here is that the way things have been happening in the past isn't necessarily how they're gonna keep happening in the future. And so it's helpful to have some of the latest research on sediment, and partly that's because we've changed our ways, which is good. We're no longer hosing down the Sierras to get gold out of them, which this was hydraulic mining in the 1850s. They created this big slug of sediment that came into the bay, and other land use practices have changed sediment supply. So looking at some work here by Point Blue, where they modeled, well, what is going to happen with marshes if we look at different scenarios of sea level rise and different scenarios of sediment supply? So we're we're probably in the high sea level rise scenario, unfortunately, and looking across from left to right, that's time, and the height of the green bar is how much marsh there is. So you can see that in this low sediment supply scenario, you lose a lot of marsh by 2110. You go a few more decades out from here in their model, and you have none left. So in the low sediment supply scenario, we're probably gonna lose marshes. In a high sediment supply scenario, you can pretty much keep a lot of the marsh area that we have right now. So this is a huge knob that we can turn. This is one of these big choices we can make. And that's the reason that, that this very similar group of folks came together, that same community, and said, we need to redo that Balin's goals process that we did, and now we need to think about climate change. And so uh, over 200 people in the community came together, a big collaborative process. And one of the things I wanna point out about this a lot of details on how it worked, is the steering committee. So 26 agency steering committee, these are the state, local, and federal government folks who are going to review and permit and regulate the designs that you're gonna be working on. So these are real important folks. I think um, all of these agencies and a lot of the collaborators, every, pretty much everybody on the project is bought into this shared vision. And so I really encourage you to look at this report and understand its recommendations. I'm gonna give you a tiny, glimpse into some of the really high level recommendations, but they go down to the, a really fine scale around the Bayshore, so they can be helpful for thinking about different places you might be selecting for sites. Okay, so very quickly, a couple of the recommendations from the report. What can we do about climate change? How can we retain our important coastal wetlands? The first idea, and maybe the, one of the most important, is to restore complete systems, including processes. So I'm not saying restore tidal marsh. That's a limited, that's kind of that stable fixed idea. I'm saying restore the whole system that includes the marsh but is bigger than the marsh and really restore the processes that keep that system resilient and uh, that allow it to adapt and respond to climate change. So here's a cutaway view of the complete system. The marsh is the flat part, but you also have these subtidal elements that are helping to protect the marsh and you have the intertidal mudflat and you have the transition to the upland and that's where the marsh can migrate. So it's very important that the physical forces of the tide and the, deliver the delivery of the sediment is not interrupted.
And this is one of the things that unfortunately happens a lot with traditional development of the shoreline, is that there's something static is built here to contain the water, and now we've lost those forces that are so important for making a resilient system. So I think the challenge to you is, can you find ways, instead of building a barrier here that cuts off the sediment or cuts off the forces of the water, can you think of how to use the forces of nature to your advantage? Can you get creeks to move sediment where you want it? Can you have flooding in you know, areas that you've created, especially for flood flooding in creeks? So maybe you have parks along creeks that flood in the winter and make a great floodplain for salmon, and then in the summer people can walk their dogs there and enjoy it. Maybe there's ways, creative ways, we can start to use the landscape. And you know, if you're, if you're thinking of building a tidal barrier, you're gonna lose all the wetlands behind it, and that's not gonna be very popular. I think Jeremy's gonna talk more about that. Now looking at these processes from a higher viewpoint, I just wanna point out there's those marine processes I was talking about, the force of the tides to bring in the sediment, especially during big storms and help the marsh build up. But there's also the processes coming from the landward side. So how are creeks delivering sediment and fresh water into the baylands? And one of the things that's really important for resilience is that fresh water, fresher marshes can actually build up much faster because they have rap more rapid peat accumulation. So a salt marsh is gonna have a harder time keeping up. It's gonna need a lot more sediment, whereas a freshwater marsh makes its own sediment. So we can use a fresh our freshwater resources to help with that. Here's some examples. So now we're starting to think about, okay, well, those are great ideas. What about the real world of our real bay shore? And this is an example from a project where we were um, partnering with our wastewater treatment plants and looking at historically, what did the edge of the bay look like? You had a big creek, came into the bay, the areas where the lines are fanning out like ripples, that's where the fresh water turned into brackish water, turned into salt water. So you had very resilient marsh here. The sediment and fresh water were direct, directly delivered to the marsh and then the water went to the bay. And you had this light green wetland all along the back shore. Now those big creeks are levied all the way out to the bay. The marsh has been diked and turned into managed ponds or other land uses. And the sediment and fresh water are delivered way out into the bay. So we're trying to think of how we can reconfigure the shoreline. We've completely lost the wetlands also in the back. So here's an idea. If we work with our partners at the wastewater treatment plants, can we have some of their fresh water that they might like to polish in a wetland for tertiary treatment, send it into the back of a marsh, have that more resilient freshwater marsh, restore some of the ponds to turn it into a, a tidal marsh, and then deliver the sediment and water where we want them, and hopefully solve some problems for the wastewater treatment plant, which they're having to deal with sea level rise, at the same time as restoring some ecological values. And just to point out, there's lots of different kinds of creek bay connectivity, and there's lots of different ways that's been changed now. And so we can think of a variety of innovative solutions to using the resources we have in more hybrid, syncretic ways. So in case this has, point hasn't been made clearly enough, sediment is no longer a waste product in the bay. It's a precious resource. We gotta think about how we can get it back from behind dams. Can we pulse flows? Can we... Um, can we spill water from below, from below our reservoirs? These are all kinds of things that in the larger system that your designs are gonna be plugging into, we wanna be thinking about. And even can we use excavated upland sediment? And that might be something that actually fits into some of the designs. They're, they're, now, they're now restoring marshes and building levees out of um, sediment that's excavated from, from new development projects. Okay. So another key recommendation is to restore soon in places that marshes are likely to persist. And we can help with information about where we think marshes will stay if that's gonna be one of your designs. You don't wanna to suggest to build a marsh in a place where it's just gonna erode. The other thing to know is that whoop, there's a lot, we're not, we're not friends, okay. That there's a lot of projects going on to restore habitats around the bay. So we can help you know where these are. If you zoom in, this is the resilience atlas that Robin was talking about. You can get a sense of where the projects are. And there's a lot that have been done. There's some that are planned. There's some that will be done in the future. These are really important things for you to know about. And then finally, plan for the balance to migrate. So we started talking about that um, with a question just previously. And I think this is a really big challenge for you. What are the new ideas that you have about how we can deal with a, change, a changing or a migrating shoreline? So here's an easy place to think about it, pretty undeveloped area. Let's say this is the edge of the bay now. This is the edge of the bay where it will be in 50 years. 
how are you going to think about that change in, in that space? If your design is in between those two lines, what do you do? So, man, some of these um, strategies that we've thought about so far are you can serve the land, you try to keep it from being developed, or maybe you construct something there that can change over time. So you've probably heard about the horizontal levee designs. We're going to hear about more about that from Jeremy. Or you can plan retreat, or maybe you have some kind of new idea. Maybe there's a way that your designs can change over time or can move or can accommodate flooding underneath them. Not so, maybe not in the next 20 years, but in the 20 years after that. We'd really love to see some visuals about how this kind of thinking is incorporated in your work. Okay, so those are three key ideas at the regional level. We have seven other regional recommendations. Then we have recommendations for each sub-embayment, and there are recommendations for each segment of the Bay Shore. So hopefully that, <laughs> don't worry, I'm not gonna tell you all of those, but I think there is a lot there that can be helpful to use. And so just to touch on what the next two speakers are gonna talk about, these ideas I think may seem pie in the sky, especially for those who are embroiled in the real life challenges of building anything in a city. And so I just want, the next couple talks are gonna talk about sort of real life examples, practical approaches to, to incorporating these ideas and real designs. And so one, Julie's gonna talk about how do we think about what's appropriate to do where along the shoreline. And Jeremy's gonna give you some real life examples of some of these things that are starting to go on the ground. And with that, I just wanna leave you with this thought that this is this critical crossroads for us. We have choices to make. What are our structures gonna look like? They're gonna address resiliency and climate change. And I wanna encourage you to go with this kind of design. And it looks like, oh, it's a picture of a marsh. Some people say, well, you just took a picture of a marsh, right? And the truth is, there's actually a lot of engineered elements. There's a, um, or constructed elements. There's a protective beach. There's a protective, they're hard to see, and I don't have a pointer. There's a protective oyster reef. There is a managed pond. You have people and recreating and using a space that can flood sometimes. You have a wild area on the other side of the creek and you're using dredge material to um, help keep the shoreline elevation up. So these, these things can look really beautiful and look really natural and yet include a lot of elements of um, engineering and construction, very careful design elements to make them really valuable ecologically. So thanks for your attention. I want to thank the funders of the Balin's Goals Project. Are we good, Katie? So we, we have time for a couple questions. So I, I just read I just read the Balin's climate report and I came away with the maybe incorrect conclusion that um, managed ponds and diked wetlands were highly unsustainable ecosystems. And it's not like a, a word that I've applied to ecosystems before. So I'm wondering how you feel about that statement and what you would say about those systems. I th so, the qu so I think managed ponds and managed wetlands are less resilient ecosystems. Um, they're going to require management, that's going to cost money, and that's hard to figure out how to fund. And so they might be unsustainable economically. I think they could be, they could be managed and we could, in, we could invest in them. And the issue now is that we really need to. And a lot of the reason that we need those habitats is because we've taken all the wetlands from the Central Valley. So we're dealing with some scale issues that there are changes that have happened in California at a larger scale that are constraining what can happen at the base scale. So even though, I think that was a good point, even... Um, even though there are these unnatural elements in the vision of what the future could look like, we're gonna need some of them. And this is where I think innovative ideas can help, can help us think about, you know, how do we get sort of the most function out of each element that we're putting in our design so it can accommodate a lot of different needs and be resilient. Does that answer your question? Alex, Alex oh. I'm sorry, Susan. <laughs> I'm almost uh, there. Okay. 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 Uh, Klaus has a question. Okay. Um, let's, let's see here. Uh, I am wondering. So, so okay. So, one of the, it seems like the t design teams are coming in, and there's a lot of work that's been done. So, and part of what you're representing is um, our a whole range of projects, but also a way of conceptually thinking about and you know uh, addressing the risks and the opportunities. I'm wondering, in some ways, I think there's, a, there's an opportunity where the design teams may come up with a whole new set of ideas and concepts 
where um, approaches that you're thinking about then can be uh, can fit in and can augment. Uh, and other ways that they could build and kind of re interconnect those kinds of ideas and projects that you have and make them something new. Can you sort of like describe from your perspective um, for, for SFEI, what would be a, kind of like an ideal situation after RBD you know, is um, completed for what you would envision as where you are now and where you would like to be? Thanks, Alex, that's a great question. We would love it if the interaction that we have with you all leads to a big step up in how we're thinking about this. If we had a bunch of new ideas, if we had some very specific designs, and ideally an idea of how they all fit together at the larger regional scale, and, and I think that would really, that would help find the money to do some of them. And that would get would do one of these big like we were I was talking about with the Balin's goals we got all that restoration done because of a particular process I think this process could get a lot of shoreline change to happen in a really positive way so we're hoping that that this sort of percolation and inter, intermingling can create that opportunity. I'm wondering whether you have some illustrations hidden away in another chapter that show an urban edge and the ways in which you can change an urban edge uh, or create one because it actually could have a positive effect. Uh, ra uh, anything other than that last sort of concrete ditch you show. If you do, if not, do you have an idea, ideas for them? Is that your next charge? Thank you. Yeah, that's a great point. I think Julie and Jeremy are gonna talk about that somewhat more, more, you know, I've showed some extremes here. Um, what are the things that we can do in different parts of the bay rather than just where you can restore a giant wetland? I also think that's something where we need more work in the bay. Um, we really need some new interesting ideas about what to do in the places where this opportunity has been lost largely because we've already built out houses, you know, all over all that marsh plain. And then what are you going to do? Then you really have limited choices except doing some very You've got some real hardscape out at the edge. So what can you do with that? And I think there's a. I think you guys know a lot of these ideas, but you can put underwater berms, oyster reefs. You know, whatever's appropriate in that location. And some of it might be pretty new because some of those locations are very high energy. So I think that is a good challenge for us all. Oh, I'm out of time, guys. This was fun. Thank you.